the Word of God. But uh, I want you to open your Bible with me this morning to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. I've been chewing on this for a while now because I've been preaching on revival and the need for it. The Bible says, stir up the gift that's within you. In Hebrews, it talks about us not forsaking the assuming of ourselves together, but to stir up one another to faith and good works. And so I've been trying to stir a pot for revival. And I said the other night in our prayer meeting that my flame may be small, but it's still a fire. And it can catch somebody else on fire. And as I was reading Philippians chapter 3, I'm not one of those preachers that can plan a month of, of, of messages. I don't know what I'm going to preach, really, until I get in the pulpit. I'm pretty sure Saturday night, but there have been times I got here and the Lord changed everything. So I've never attempted to say, okay, send out a mail out. These are my four sermons for the next four weeks. Because something might happen, I've got to change. And... Uh, so that's just the way that I'm wired. Those other guys might just be smarter than I am. I don't know. But in Philippians chapter 3, Paul's writing and he says, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. For me to write the same things to you is not tedious. But for you, it is safe. Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Now this is... Paul speaking, this is one of the, if you wanted to classify it like this, and I really don't because we're all the same in Christ, but we would look at Paul as one of the heroes of the faith, a godly man. But Jesus even called a woman a dog. When she came for healing, he said, it's not right for me to give bread, you know, the children's bread to the dogs. And I found it fascinating that the woman did not get mad at Jesus for calling her a dog. She accepted it, and she said, even the dogs get the crumbs. And so here's Paul said, beware of the dogs, beware of the evil workers, beware of the mutilation. For we are the circumcision who worship God in the Spirit. Rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks that he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. Paul said, I was circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews. Concerning the law, he said, I was a Pharisee. Concerning zeal, I persecuted the church. Concer concerning the righteousness, which is in the law, he said, I was blameless. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted lost for Christ. Yet indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and I count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray for your anointing this morning. I pray that your word will be preached, our hearts would be stirred, that we'd be conformed more to the image of Jesus and walk in the joy of the Lord, which is our strength. That, God, we would experience revival. We've been praying for revival. Oh, God, start with this heart right here. Revive me, oh, God. Stir the flames in my own heart that I may desire you more, enjoy your presence, thirst for your presence, and that your word would be like a fire caught up in my bones and I have to tell somebody. 
God, anoint me to speak what you want me to speak this morning. Under the influence of the Holy Spirit, I yield myself. In Jesus' name, amen. I've read this scripture many times, <clears throat> and I have never, especially the verses 1 through 7 or 8, I preached a lot on 310, that I may know him. But on the other verses, I never connected revival with those verses. And you know, when you see a car that you've never seen before, and you go, what was that? And you look at it, and you find out what kind of car that was, and you'd never seen it before. And after you find out what it is, it seems like the rest of that week, you see cars like that everywhere. And you're thinking, man, I didn't even see that one. When you start thinking about things with God, He starts showing you things in the Scripture. When you're sick in body and you begin feasting and eating the Word of God where it concerns healing, you see so many things jumping out at you that said God still heals today. With revival, this jumped out at me because when I got saved, I knew that there was nothing in me that could please God. When I got saved, I knew God came looking for me. We had a, uh, Billy Graham had a crusade back right about the time I got saved. I think he had a crusade in the Lubbock area in 1977 or 78. I got saved in 75. So he's probably there 76 or 77. Because I was a young Christian, I went to the Billy Graham crusade. I got lost in that big Texas Tech stadium. I'd never been any place that big. And when I got lost, I ended up by this trailer at the big Coliseum. And I'm about from, you know, 15 yards from the trailer, and the door opens, and Billy Graham comes out. And here I am, a, a senior in high school, I think, so I'm say 76, 77. And Billy Graham comes out, he walks out, and he walks down, and he shakes my hand and says, Hi, I'm Billy Graham. And here's an 18-year-old boy, and Billy Graham's got my hand, and I'm just looking at him. What do you say when Billy Graham shakes your hand and says, Hi, I'm Billy Graham. I'm Mike Stevens. <laughs> I don't know what I said. I don't know if I said, I'm Mike Stevens. I just thought, wow. You know, wow. But... Shaking his hand was a wow for me. But being in the presence of God, there was in the, in the Hebrides revival, a young boy, 15 years old, was praying, and the main preacher was Duncan Campbell, came to the barn to speak with the young boy. He interrupted his prayer. He said, excuse me, Mr. Campbell. He said, I'm in conversation with the king right now. And the famous preacher just kind of backed off. I've been hungry for revival. I got saved knowing I needed Jesus. And when I got saved, I knew I needed Jesus. Two points in my life when I got, when I got saved, I knew I need you, God, to do this. And I don't know why, but the second time was when I got married. I woke up the next morning after I had married Tanya. And this feeling came upon me of complete fear. I had never felt fear like I felt the morning I woke up after we got married. I walked out on this dock where we had gone for our honeymoon at this lake. And I'm on the edge of that dock. And I'm telling you, I was so afraid. Terrified. This is something that I have committed to for the rest of my life. And the only person that I had ever committed to for the rest of my life that was going well was with Jesus. I got saved in 75. I got married in 83. And I said, God, I need you to make this marriage work. I need you, God. I can't. This is going to have to be you. All this stuff flooded in my mind. I don't know why it did, but I went out there. I just prayed. I said, oh, God. I said, I need you. And I look back on that now, I still need God to have a great marriage. 
I still need God if I'm going to live the Christian life. And I know in revival, it is all God. It is not man. It is God. Man prays for revival. Man builds the altar. Man puts the wood on the altar. But only God can bring the fire. Elijah could put the sacrifices and they filled it up with water. Only God himself could come and lick up all the sacrifices. And so often in our life, we, we get saved and, and we're living for God. And we think, you know, I'm used to this. I figured this out. I've known the Christian way. I can handle it. I don't really need to pray like I used to pray. I don't really need to read the Bible. Because, I mean, I really love God in my heart. I don't know how many people I've witnessed to that were living in sin that said, well, I love God. One of my best friends when I was in college was an older man and used to play guitar with Janis Joplin and Jimi Hendrix. And he played guitar and he played for Billy Graham's Crusades. And he and I became friends and we went to places and he would sing and minister and I would watch him. He had this old electric guitar. He just threw it in the trunk of his car. There was no case or anything. He just threw it in the trunk of his car. And then he'd pull it out, and he'd get up there, and while he's playing it, he'd tune it, and he would sound just like Jimi Hendrix. And one day, he just decided his wife was, a, was an ex-prostitute. He was an ex-pimp. He came home one day from a Billy Graham crusade, and his wife said, I put our Christ my Christianity on the back burner. I'm going back into prostitution. And he said, well, I'll put mine on the back burner with you. And he went back into the world. I was crushed. He had this big old afro, this, this gigantic smile. And now he's not living for God, and he's playing in a bar in Amarillo, Texas. And I went to the bar. Tanya was with me. And I sat there. I didn't even recognize him. I didn't know the afro that he had was a wig. He was really bald-headed. And he shaved his head, and he was bald-headed, and, and he's up there, and he was playing his music. And I was sitting out at the table with Tanya, and then he took a break, and he came down, and I said, I've come here to take you home, to get you out of this. And I began to witness to him, one of my mentors. And he said, well, I still love God. I'm just not serving him right now. I said, you don't love God. The Bible says if you love God, you'll keep his word. You're not keeping his word. Don't tell me that you love God and that you're living in sin. And he said, man, you're hard. You're hard. I said, Jimmy, before, I got, uh, before you backslid, you loved my preaching. Now that you're on the other side of the preaching, you don't like it. It's hard. I said, it's not hard. I love you, and I'm telling you the truth. I said, I'm walking out of here, and I want you to walk out of here with me. If you don't, I'll break fellowship with you. I will not eat with you again until you come back to Christ. You're a professing Christian in this city. You're famous in this city. Now you have tainted the Lord's name. And I said, I break my relationship with you. Because you know what you're doing and you're willingly living in sin when you profess to be a Christian. And I walked out. And my goodness, that was probably 35 years ago. Every now and then I pull him up on YouTube and he's still doing the same thing. I don't understand it. Except where he thought he could do it on his own. Paul said right here, beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the mutilation. Who were these people? These were people right here that claimed basically that Judaism was still greater than Christianity. These Jews had gotten saved, and now he was telling the Philippians, don't listen to these people. They're evil workers. Anything that offers salvation without Christ is evil. It will destroy you. He called them dogs. He says, beware of them. Don't go back to works. Don't go back to the special holidays. Don't go back and think, that's what makes me a, a believer. That's what makes me right with God. Don't go back to the sacrifices. He said, we're of the circumcision who worship God in the spirit. 
See, the Jews believed they were saved and, and they were circumcised and circumcision proved that they were right with God. And what Paul was saying is, we have the circumcision of the heart. We worship God in the spirit. Rejoice in Christ Jesus. And he says, have no confidence in the flesh. If I could say to any new believer, what's the greatest advice I could give them? Don't put any confidence in the flesh. Don't think you're spiritual enough to win the battle. Revival is this. Revival is recognizing that I need God. Revival is recognizing that I can't accomplish anything without God. Revival is recognizing that you can vote who you want to vote for and get them in office. It's not going to change America. Only God can change America. Changing my surrounding will not change me. Changing where I live will not change me. Getting up in the morning and looking in the mirror and saying, I will live for God, I will live for God, that's not going to help. Getting up in the morning and becoming in Christ that's going to help. Paul says, we worship God in the Spirit. We have been born again through the blood of Jesus. Not through circumcision. Not through keeping the Passover now. Not through bringing sacrifices to the priest. Not through confession at a confessional booth but through Christ. We worship God in the Spirit. Not in the flesh. I've heard the worst, I've heard worse guitar playing than mine and heard stronger anointing. I've heard horrible singers sing an a cappella and weep because of the anointing. Because they were doing it in the spirit. They were doing it with absolute abandonment and looking upon Jesus. He said rejoice in Jesus Christ and have no confidence in the flesh. None. Don't have confidence that you can find everything in your life and get it right. Have confidence that God knows your heart and you've come to Christ, and you have surrendered to Christ, and you've thrown yourself onto Him, and you've said to Him, listen, I need you now, I needed you then, I'm going to need you in the future. I don't want you to ever leave me. I don't want to ever leave you. I want to stay right by your side. And then he goes on to say this, if you're tempted to do that, I want to remind you, if anybody has the temptation to put confidence in the flesh, Paul said, it would have been me. Why? I was circumcised on the eighth day, exactly when I was supposed to be. I was of the stock of Israel, God's chosen people, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews. And he said, concerning the law, he said, I was a Pharisee. He said, concerning zeal, I persecuted the church. Concerning the righteousness which is in the law, he said, I kept it. I was blameless. But what things were gained to me, he said, these I have counted lost for Christ. He said, what things everybody looked at and said, that's great, Paul. You're, you're absolutely, you, you fulfilled everything in the law. And Paul said, I count it as loss for Christ. He said, I take all of that I count it as rubbish. He said, yet, yeah, indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Jesus Christ, my Lord, for whom I suffered. He suffered for that loss. He said, not only do I count it as lost, I have suffered for it. I have been persecuted because I walked away from that. You look at today's standards, and these people were telling them, just keep the law. Go back to Judaism. Go back to your rituals. You can flip that a little bit today, and a lot of the preaching today is not even saying that. Today what they're saying is, Jesus loves you. Just the way you are. You can continue in this lifestyle. No problem. You're fine with God. He loves you. 
And just think about that. He loves you. He does love me. But man, there's also the judgment sign of God. If you read this Bible, you can see the anger of God. I don't want on that side of God. I want to live on the side of grace. But we've got preachers today in churches that say you can live in this lifestyle and you can still be a Christian. If you want to swap wives, that's fine. If you want to live a homosexual lifestyle, that's fine. If you want to be a fornicator, that's fine. God loves you, just come. And gradually, you know, if you never grow out of it, that's okay. God loves you as long as your intentions are right. That's just fine. And Paul would be calling these people dogs and evil workers. He would say, beware of them. This is the gospel that we preach. So you got one size. They would see putting confidence in the flesh as trying to live for God. No, confidence in the flesh is thinking everything's all right. I'm fine. And Paul says, no, you're not. And he said, I count all things that I had accomplished what was good. I count them as rubbish. I count it as trash. I count it as filth. I don't even want it near me. He said, I want to be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law but that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness which is from God by faith. When we get to heaven, we're going to have a garment on. And it's the garment of Jesus. God gives us the story in the Bible where they had the wedding and the guy snuck in, didn't have the wedding garment that the father had sent out and said, who is this man? He snuck in here. How do you know? Because he doesn't have the wedding garment on. That wedding garment is the righteousness of Jesus. We're clothed from the top of our head to the soles of our feet. Nothing is showing. If I've got to work with radiation, I want everything covered. I want to make sure the gloves that I got on are covered. Matter of fact, I know people, you know, they're barbecue, and they got these gloves now that you can barbecue in, and you can just pick up the, the wood and stack it right in the fire. You can just pick it up and stack it. I guarantee you, before I pick it up and stack it, I want to make sure that there's no holes in that glove. The smallest little hole is just enough. It's like my friend who I've told the story. His daddy raises honeybees. And he puts on this suit to go in and get his honey. And he didn't know it. All these years he'd been putting on this suit, there was a little hole right in the rear end of that suit. And as he got in there getting his honey... All of a sudden, his rear end started stinging because there was a little hole in that suit. When I heard that story, what I got from it, when I stand before God, I don't want any holes. I want to be totally clothed with Jesus from head to toe. And Paul said, I want to be found in him. I want my righteousness in him, not from the law, but the righteousness which is from God by faith, and faith alone. He said that I may know him. I want to know him, the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. That word know is not know about him. That word know is to have an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. I know my wife. We can complete each other's sentences. I can look at her when she's saying she's fine, and I know she's not fine. Why? Because I know her. My kids, I know. Jen, what's wrong? Nothing, I'm fine. No, you're not. Come over here and sit down. Something is wrong. Well, that well is the beginning of, okay, I'm going to tell you. An intimate relationship. They're not visitors at my house. They live with me. I live with them. And Paul said, I want to know God. I want to know Jesus intimately. I want to know the ways of God. I want the thoughts of God. I want the eyes of God. 
I want the ears of God. I want the touch of God. I want to know Him, the power of God. I want to know the power of His resurrection. I want to know the sufferings of Jesus. Every dimension where I can know Him, I want to know Him because I want to be conformed to His death. Wow. Conformed to His death. Because he needs to live in the resurrection. He said, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. And Paul spelled it out right here. I want to know him. John, in verse 113, says, We were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. We're here because it's God's will. Can't commit suicide. You're here because it's God's will. God has placed you here. He was the one that orchestrated our birth. We're not even here by the will of man. People that are born out of wedlock, they're not here out of the will of man, but out of the will of God. Oh yeah, he uses sin to can turn it around for good. In Romans 2.29 says circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit and not in the letter. Paul is saying, then this is revival. We have to get back to the place where we say we need God. And when you know that you need God, you do everything mentally, physically possible to say I'm going to pursue God. I read a statement the other day that just caught me off guard. You've got to work to be holy. But I thought you said don't put confidence in the flesh. You don't put confidence in the flesh. But you do have a striving. We do have a pursuing. We do have a thing called I'm pressing on toward the mark. I'm pressing on. And Paul said that I may win Christ. I want to win Christ. Not that I've already attained it or am I already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has laid hold of me. I'm moving on. I'm not sitting there saying, okay, God, make me what you want me to be. No, God has put something in me and he stirred me and I'm moving with that. This morning, I did not want to get up out of bed because I felt so bad. And I got up and I went back to bed. And I said, Tanya, you're going to have to preach. And I lay there for a few minutes. And I started going on my head by his stripes, I'm healed. And I felt at that moment God put the gift of faith. And I said, I'm getting up. I could have laid there and said, God, I'm not going to get up until I feel completely strong and healthy. I got up by the stripes of Jesus. I started walking. If you had saw me and didn't know who I was, walking around going, by his stripes I'm healed, by his stripes I'm healed, by his stripes I'm healed. I don't know how many times this morning I said, by his stripes I'm healed, by his stripes I'm healed. I know my whole shower. I said, by his stripes I'm healed, by his stripes I'm healed. It wasn't by the flesh. I was pushing. I was pressing. I was saying, God, I believe. He that knows to do good and does it not to him it's sin. I'm striving toward that, Lord. And I want to know you. I am going to do something in my life. I'm going to arrange time in my life. I'm going to set aside time in my life to know you. A quote that I read a few weeks ago. I don't have time to pray. I have never had time to pray. Very, I can't look in my life and say, oh yeah, I had time. I make time to pray. If you're looking to have time for praying, you know what, you're not going to have it. I've never really had time to pray. I had to make time to pray. I had to walk away from this and walk over to this. If we're going to have revival in America, the church of Jesus Christ is going to have to realize it's not going to come by the work of the flesh. It's not going to come by a Christian president. It's not going to come by Christian legislation. It's not going to come... I prayed for the day that abortion is outlawed. 
that people come to their senses. Revival's not going to come if abortion is outlawed. Revival's not going to come if sin is made illegal. Revival's going to come when man throws himself or herself at the feet of Jesus and say, Lord, I need you. I've been living a religious life. I've been going to church and I've been checking the boxes. Oh God, I went to church because it was really cool. We could take our Starbucks into church and, and have donuts in the church and we could come in late. We could sit out at the bar at, at the church and we could sit out there and listen to the service. Think about that. How can we feed the flesh and try to get into the spirit? How can we feed the flesh? We're coming in. We're wanting, are we really wanting God to move on us? Or we just want to come in because we're religious? Well, you know, I got my hot dog and my Coke. I was at a church and a guy came in with a hot dog and a Coke. Big old drink. Eating it as he walked him down the aisle. Then he finished it. All he had was this big drink. And he walked down to the front of the church where everybody was standing. And he put his hands up in the air, had the drink. And he was sipping here like this and worshiping God. And I looked at him. And folks, I'm going to tell you, it made me sick in my stomach. And I said, you don't know the same God I know. He's too majestic. He's too powerful. He, he's too holy. He's too deserving. He's too deserving for me to come down there with my cap on even. I mean, he's God. Got to be some realization that he's not like my friends. That I'm not just going here because I'm a Christian. I'm coming to meet with the king. I want him. And God, I've tried in the flesh. I put confidence in the flesh. And every time that I do, I fail. I find myself in absolute failure. The highest form of worship in faith is saying, God, I can't do it. My youth pastor, my spiritual father, said to me when I was in high school, Mike, the Christian life is not an easy life to live. And he said, Mike, the Christian life is not a hard life to live. He said, the Christian life is impossible without God. And at the time, I thought, well, that's good. But now at 59 years old, that's truth. That's truth. Because we paint this picture, you know, come to Jesus, everything's going to be fine, everything. Paul said, I lost everything. I lost everything. It didn't matter. I counted it already lost. I counted it as trash. What I lost was trash. Isn't it amazing how you have something you don't want, you can put it out in front of your house and nobody steals it? Must be trash. They stick out in front of the house. But leave it sitting outside and you forgot it and somebody steals it. Paul was saying, this is trash. What I have lost was nothing. It was trash compared to Christ, compared to Jesus. If we're going to have revival, it starts right here in our hearts with us saying, you know what, God? I got into this American gospel thinking that just going to church was it. And I got frustrated. Going to church didn't fulfill it. Doing all the things and checking the boxes, I'm still empty. And if we could hear the voice of God, he said, yeah, because that's all flesh. That's no better than Judaism. Go to church, get baptized, give them the offering. Show up when they have the doors open. And you're checking that off and saying, boy, I'm doing good. I'm doing good. I'm doing good. But you go home Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and it's horrible. And you're depressed. And you're depressed because you don't understand what Jesus has done. If we understood the work that he's accomplished, and it's not on us anymore. It's not on us. We don't have to be perfect. Our spirits are already made perfect. We have to pursue God. 
And he will conform us. He will conform us to his image. But if you start keeping the law, let me tell you what, it's a bad taskmaster. Because you're always wondering, did you do enough? Did you find enough? Did you confess enough? You know what the Spirit says? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. How do I know I'm believing? That's the question. How do I know I'm believing? You know because your life has been changed. Period. You cannot put faith in Jesus Christ and not have a change in your life. And that change continues. I've been saved for 43 years now, and I'm still being changed. I'm still being conformed to the image of Jesus. I'm still being convicted of sin. I still have to confess sin because I want to be conformed to the image of Jesus. I keep wanting to press in. I keep wanting to die to myself. God is going to one day kill this body. I'm not talking about the grave. If I live long enough, I've heard testimonies where God had destroyed all of the stuff and all they wanted was Jesus. Malcolm Muggeridge said, all I look forward to now is Jesus. He said, I, I don't have the temptations anymore. The scales have fallen off. He said, I've been successful. I don't have a desire for success. I don't have a desire that's erotic. I don't have a desire for my wife. I don't have a desire for fame. I don't have a desire for money. He said, I enjoy my wife. We sit in the living room. He was 89 years old, and we read books together. She's got one. I've got one. We've got our tea. We're reading the books. He said, I just have one desire. It's Jesus. Jesus. But until then, we keep pressing on. We keep running toward the finish line. We don't jog. We're, when we go after God, it's full sprint. I see him. I'm running after him. I want to attain the prize. The prize is God himself. And that means you, you grasp it. He, he slows down. You're going and He slows down so you can catch him. But he waits on you. He waits on me to want him. And when I read Philippians chapter 3, I see revival all over it because it is saying man has to get out of himself and start putting his eyes upon Jesus. President Trump was criticized by the ACLU for how many times he used the word America in his State of the Union. And I'm thinking, you know, some people probably get ticked at preachers as many times as they use Jesus. It's the greatest name I know. I would love to be criticized for the State of the Union address for how many times I use the word Jesus. As a Christian, we can't use it enough. In him, we live, we move, and we have our being. In him, we live, and we move, and we have our being. I want to know him, the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. I want you to close your eyes, and I want you to think about that phrase. I want to know him, Paul said, the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. That God, we want to know you. Every area that you will reveal yourself. You said the secret things belong to you, but the things revealed belong to us, our children, and our children's children. It's in the open. It may not be just sticking out like a thumb, but you've revealed it. If we will look, if we'll pay attention, if we'll press in, that you reveal more things to us. And God, what we desire this morning is to be conformed to the image of Jesus. I pray, Lord, in this service or through the internet, anybody that listens to this message that doesn't have a personal relationship with you, oh God, I pray that today that they will confess Jesus Christ as Lord. That they'll believe in their heart that you died on a cross, that you rose from the dead, and that they confess with their mouth, Jesus is Lord, Jesus is Lord, controlling my life. I give it to you. It's no longer mine. I pick up my cross. I die to myself, 
and I follow you. And God, I pray for those, including myself, that we will not put confidence in the flesh. That we'll get flesh stinks in your presence. That God, more and more we will desire and press in to live by the Spirit, desiring the things that the Spirit desires. When we start desiring stuff that we know doesn't please you, God, we pray that you'll begin to change it. The thoughts will be arrested and replaced with thoughts about you, Lord God. That, Lord, we are serious about our faith. We want to know Jesus, the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. Help us, O oh God, to know that this morning. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.